is David Bernstein, founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, and this is the SpeechCast, a joint venture between the JILV and the Speech Project of the Jewish Journal. I'm really happy to have with us today uh, Seth Moskowitz. Um, Seth is an editor at Persuasion. Uh, Persuasion is this online publication that emphasizes liberal values and um, and ideas. Um, it's I've been published twice in it. I'm honored to say Seth uh, has been recently had an article in it called "Don't Apologize," which I'm really excited to discuss. Um, Seth is a 2017 graduate from Emory. He's worked in political campaigns. He spent a year in Rwanda, um, and uh, an excellent writer. And I'm really happy to have you, Seth. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I've I've listened to your podcast and seen the other guests that you've had. So honored to be among them. Great. So, um, so Seth, you wrote this piece, um, Don't Apologize. Tell me a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about what your argument is. Yeah, so I think at this point, we've all seen what happens when someone posts an idea on the internet or says something that gets on the internet that um, is broadly seen as inappropriate or intolerable among the left or among the right, and a mob descends on them. Um, it's pretty. It's gotten very common um, among the left. I think it's more common on the left than among the than on the right. Um, and essentially, the mob goes after this person and attacks them for any supposed transgression or thought crime or an idea that goes against the, the their general values. Um, and the idea of the article is that the people, when they're facing this, this mob that's attacking them, they should take the criticism seriously and they should think, okay, have I said or done anything that's actually wrong? And if they have, then they should apologize because uh, apologizing and, and self-reflection is, is an important part of self-growth. Self -growth. Um, and, and we should always take criticism seriously. But the other half of the argument is that if you reflect on this criticism, and you come to the conclusion that you haven't actually done anything wrong, then you should stand up for your ideas and refuse to apologize um, publicly. Because if you acquiesce to the mob and you apologize, then it only allows them to continue doing this to other innocent people. So essentially, the 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 core of the idea is stand up for yourself if you don't think you've done anything anything wrong. Um, because it's important to our liberal institutions and our liberal democracy that people stand up for what they believe. So I want to push back on one aspect of it a little bit. I'm not sure I disagree with you, but it's an interesting issue because I think I've experienced this in my own recent career fighting for liberalism and opposing the imposition of ideology. Um, let's say you you agree that there's some merit in the criticism, but that the mob is really overplaying it exponentially. Um, there is an argument, still don't apologize, because if you do, in this current ideological environment, those folks smell blood, and they're going to exploit your apology in ways that actually don't allow you to show the integrity that you might have hoped. What do you make of that, that uh, sort of retort? Yeah, I think that's interesting. And, and I think that's a, a valid critique. You know, it, it's not always so clear cut as the article might make it seem. I mean, every instance is, is unique. But what I'd say is that your response should be less a response to how harsh the criticism is and more a response to once you, set, once you take the time to reflect on yourself and reflect on your actions, um, what your true conclusion is. Um, I don't think you necessarily should define your actions based on the response to them. I think you should define your actions based on the actions themselves and how you analyze them and look back on them and, and decide if they were right or wrong. And I think that's how you should determine how you respond to these, these criticisms. Um, on the other hand, if, if you're a private person and you did something that wasn't public, but somehow became public, say you have like, 20 Twitter followers and you tweet something that's slightly off color and it blows up, 
then maybe there's a, a, a case to be made that you're not a public person and this does you shouldn't be in the public eye anyways so you shouldn't be making a public apology but if you're if you're if you're a public person and you reflect regardless of how harsh the criticism is and you think that you did something wrong i think you should be honest um, about your apology and if if you don't think you did anything wrong then it's the same thing you shouldn't apologize the guy who edits this uh, podcast, uh, Dan, um, and I talked about this prior to your piece coming out, and he uh, likes to say, and he thinks he's a big believer in the apology. And when I told them, you know, there might be a risk in apologizing for something that I'm, I'm usually a believer as well. I think apologies can allow people to move on. Both the person who committed the act and the people who have been victimized by an act, apology allows you to move forward. Yet, uh, yet I see the politics of it being problematic sometimes, like that, that smelling blood phenomenon, especially at a time when there's a lot of mob advocacy going on. Um, and he says that's a Trumpian statement. I and mean, these are his words, a little, or maybe Roy Cohen, um, that that it never apologize, never apologize. Um, does does that strike? Did that strike you as well? That you know, there is a little bit of that um, Trumpian edge to it. That that you know, th th that that this is the kind of uh, uh, we're playing into that politics. Uh, well, it, from my perspective, I mean, I don't think. Donald Trump ever really seriously took the criticism to heart. I think that's that's a key part of my argument is that you need to take you need to look at the criticism and really take the time to self reflect. And I don't necessarily think that's something that Donald Trump really ever did. And I don't think that's a lot of that's necessarily what a lot of people on the left, to be fair, on the left would do either. I don't think they're going to really take the criticism that they they face to heart um, and really take the time to self reflect on it. I think that's. A, a key part of the argument is that you have to you have to take the time to look at the criticism um, and the value of the criticism because if you if you take the time to look at it and genuinely decide that it's invalid, then where is well, why should you apologize? Um, I, I think that that the key to this is coming to the criticism and looking at it with good faith. Um, and I, I agree with the, with the idea that once people smell blood in the water, that the apology might not necessarily be effective politically. Um, and, and I can see why politicians or political figures might make a decision about their apology based on the public relations aspect of it. But I think that's plain just wrong and, and, and you're sacrificing your integrity when you do so. Um, I don't think you should be basing your response based on how the public's gonna react um, if, if it's going to lose you voters or lose you money, um, I think you should be genuine to yourself and, and, and really take the time to put out a statement or to, to not put out a statement based on your true belief. Um, and that might come across as naive to some people, but I think that's okay. I think um, this is an ideal. And even though everybody might not follow it, I think some people may read the piece or may may listen to this this podcast and say okay if something like this happens to me um i'm going to stand up for myself and other people might not fully take the advice but might incorporate some of the ideas into their response and maybe not bend the knee um and and apologize in such an obsequious manner as they may have before so let me actually just put my case study out there for a second okay so um, I wrote an opinion piece. I'm not going to name the opinion piece, but um, I wrote an opinion piece that um, that was fiercely criticized by many of the typical adversaries or uh, of this of, of this perspective. Um, most of the criticism was just outlandish and was you know a repetition of what I was criticizing in the in the first place. But there were people who were arguing that I really didn't have enough evidence to prove the point that I was making. And I think that they were probably right. I'm not sure I could have gotten the evidence had I made even a stronger effort to do so. And I think that even without the evidence, my thesis was correct in the article, but I thought that the point was that I probably didn't live up to my own highest standards of of documentation and proof for the argument I was trying to make and that that could have negative consequences on the institutions that I was critiquing. 
And and so my 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 feeling after talking to a couple of people was to actually issue an apology. But then um, I started talking to other people within my circle who say, "Don't apologize. They're going to smell blood, and it will not. And it will. They'll use it to discredit you." And in the end, the decision was made not to apologize, um, which I still, you know, it, it goes against my personal grain. Yet, um, yet I understand it, and I, I, I'm not sure had I done that, that they would have been wrong. I think it would have used been used to discredit me more than just sort of standing by what I had written. Because partly that the current discourse doesn't allow you to make the 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 nuanced apology. It doesn't allow you to say I was right about one, two, and three, but I should have done four. Um, that would be completely lost, and it would be used to discredit. What do you what do you think was I was were my were the you know and there were two camps on this by the way um, within my my circle of of friends and decision makers um, would you have been among those who said go ahead with the apology I, I feel like now I'm I'm arguing against my own article um, because <laughs> <laughs> because if my understanding of the way you explained the the situation was you felt you you took the time to seriously reflect. Um, and you felt like not necessarily like you did something obscenely wrong, but like there was there was maybe something you wanted to clarify. Um, and I think that there's there's room in between issuing an abject apology um, and and straight up not uh, not saying anything. I think there's room in between those two to say to maybe put out a new article um, and with a correction and and even explain your thought process. Um, and explain where you were, where you were wrong. Explain where you were right. So I don't think every single situation needs to be boiled down to apologize or don't apologize. Um, despite the the title of my article um, and the some of the examples that I gave, but because I think that there is a middle ground where you can explain that that you made a mistake, um, but not necessarily that you did it in bad faith. Or that you did it with with uh, with bad intentions, um, but that just that we're all human, um, and that people pointed at your mistake, um, and that you want to correct it. Now, I don't necessarily think that means that you have to say, "I'm so sorry, uh, this won't ever happen again," um, and and I'm sorry for everybody that I hurt with this this article, um, because it doesn't sound like that's w- what you believed. And if you and if if the response had been to do that for for public relations purposes, then I would say that's wrong. Um, but from the way you described it, I feel like they're, they're uh, obviously, you know, the situation better than I do. Um, but my initial reaction is that um, it doesn't have to be one or the other. There could be some middle ground there, um, acknowledging the mistake, but not apologizing. Okay. So um, you're a young guy. I know that you've worked on democratic political campaigns. Um, how has it been, what, what drew you into this sort of uh liberalism space and also the space of opposing the popular ideology on the left of today, which, you know, some call it wokeness, some say critical social justice, some say whatever, there's a successor ideology, all kinds of names. We haven't really collectively settled on one. Um, Maybe you have some wisdom on that. Um, But what brought you into this space in particular? Yeah, so I was, I started college in 2013. And actually looking back on it, I I got sucked into that left ideology. I I remember being a freshman, sophomore and junior really, and kind of fully absorbing that ideology that's taken over the left. Um, And it wasn't until senior year that I started reading more broadly. I took my first political philosophy class and I started listening to some non straight left podcasts I mean, started to break out of that shell. So looking back, it's interesting because I, I kind of got sucked into the, the idea that so permeated college campuses and the left. Um, I think what I came to understand is that I don't necessarily align perfectly with one party or the other. And when you when you find yourself in that space, it frees you up to disagree with the prevailing ideas and ideologies um, on both sides. And what I came to understand also is that the bedrock principles in my politics weren't that I was a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal, a capital L liberal or a capital C conservative, but that I was a small L liberal. And that was the thing that underpinned 
all of my beliefs about politics, um, from how we should decide personally what we believe on certain issues to how we should decide publicly um, how to respond to, to certain problems and, and to pass certain policies um, in, in, in politics. So what I came, so I came to realize that I wasn't a Democrat or a Republican, um, but I was really a small a liberal um, and that the, the most important thing to me was using these liberal institutions um, and liberal values to guide myself and my, my personal beliefs and also to guide our politics and our society. So have you ever been on the uh, victim end of a cancellation campaign? Have you ever sort of felt yourself uh, at risk? So not necessarily, I, I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite, quite public enough probably to be, to be at risk of a cancellation yet. Um, but what I do remember is in college, I distinctly remember not speaking up in some of my political science classes and polit political philosophy classes um, about what I truly believed, because there was one one kid who was brave enough. He was uh, he was I think he was on the, the campus Republicans and he was pretty he was brave and he was talking about what he believed. And the rest of the class just went at him um, and it was not it was a hostile environment. Um, and, and I don't necessarily know what happened to him or if he lost friends, but but the overriding feeling of that class was that this was somebody that was outside of the accepted belief um, and was a problem. And so I felt myself just not in college, at least not wanting to, to risk that. So I, I didn't speak up for questions that I had on my mind, um, ideas that maybe went against the grain in those classes. Um, and even outside of those classes, just on the campus cult, on the campus um, in general. So, so I haven't been been a, a, a victim of cancellation, but definitely have been a victim of the the culture that that creates cancel culture. And the culture of censoriousness mm -hmm. that has pervaded some of our institutions. Um, yeah, it's kept you silenced in a sense. So, you know, that in, in some ways you could argue that's a kind of victimization. You you were in an academic environment that should bring out free discourse and challenging and thinking through ideas. And instead you kept quiet because you would have been you would have been descended on by a mob, people telling you what you must think and and telling you, you that you have no right to express the views you had. Um, so um, so you you're at persuasion and uh, what, what are some you've written this one article that's certainly done very well that seems to get a lot of eyeballs on, on apologize not apologizing what else have you written uh yeah so uh, one quick comment on on what you said before also is during last summer's protests um and the black lives matter movement i i i did get a lot of texts from friends saying, why aren't you posting about this? You need to be posting about this. You have a platform um, and, and what is wrong and why, why haven't you come out and said anything about this? So just uh, adding on to your idea of um, compelled speech and these ideas that you need to have um, at risk of being attacked if you don't, I definitely have seen that um, among my peers and have faced it, even if it's not been in the public arena. Um, and yeah, so I, I wrote that that piece, Don't Apologize for Persuasion. I have another piece that came out maybe about a month ago that is, is called Against Meme Politics. Um, and the general idea is that we shouldn't be using slogans um, as a way to, to convey our political ideas um, because doing so synthesizes and, and condenses extremely broad and expansive and complex ideas um, and condenses into something that is not representative of, of the complexity of those ideas. So some examples I gave in that piece that are probably relevant here um, is, is the idea of anti-racism. Um, when people say that in, they, in, in everyday language, what they, what they really mean is not being racist, um, which I think you and I could both agree with. But as it's been turned into in our political arena and among the left, it means something very specific. And it's, it's a slogan or a meme that people use to describe something that is extremely complex um, and, and complicated and deserves discussion. But what happens is people come at you and they say, 
are you an anti-racist? Um, and, and they don't mean it in, in a way that is, that is in good faith to start a discussion. What they want to do is pin you in a corner um, to say either, yes, I'm an anti-racist. And then they say, well, why don't you believe this, 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 and this that are all packaged inside of anti-racism? Um, or you say, no, I'm not an anti-racist. And there's, and they say, no, you're not, you're not against racism. How could that be? Um, so in general, the, the, the idea of that article is that we shouldn't be using these, these memes, these slogans um, to condense really complex ideas because all it ends up doing is having people talk past each other and having people manipulate these ideas to make a political point. Okay. So it's interesting, you know, early on after George Floyd, you know, there was a discussion about whether people should declare themselves in favor of Black Lives Matter. And my own initial thought was, yeah, like I believe Black Lives Matter. And, uh, and there are, we do have a distinct history um, and legacy of racism in this country. And declaring Black Lives Matter meant that I align my values with people who also can understand that legacy of racism in this country. What I came to realize over time, of course, is that it's a loaded phrase. It's, um, it doesn't just mean Black Lives Matter in the technical sense. It, it, it is associated with a very specific agenda, political agenda. And now I'd say, okay, I don't think I would put that sign on my front yard um, anymore. Not because I don't believe Black Lives Matter, but because I don't want to associate myself with what it's come to mean in the public debate. Um, and I think anytime you simplify a phrase like that, but then you make sure that it's um, it's got all kinds of attached ideologies, then it be, you know it's just not the best way of having a public conversation. I very much agree. And if you look at the Black Lives Matter website, I know that Black Lives Matter is a diffuse movement, but the most popular organization. If you look at their website, there's all sorts of ideas that are crammed into their platform. They have, I think, like a, a 10 demands or 12 demands or something. And some of them are so unrelated to the, the initial movement of Black Lives Matter, which is um, ostensibly about uh, police reform. There's some ideas that are about, about like capitalism right. and ideas that get into Israel. And it, 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 I think Black Lives Matter is a perfect example of, of a, a a slogan that we use that you and I can both agree like black lives do in fact matter, obviously. Um, but the way that it's used um, in, in contemporary politics is just so, so freighted with so many different ideas that it's almost become, become useless um, as a, as a way to determine if you um, believe that we need police reform, or if you believe that we need to, to, to do to pass policies to um, advance to to advance safety safety in our cities or any any specific policy um, is so unrelated to and so unclear to to in relation to Black Lives Matter that the actual use of the phrase has become useless. So when you look on the horizon of the liberal project. Um, there are optimists like Jonathan Rausch who say, um, you know, I'm I'm heartened that liberals are fighting back now, and we are, um, and finding our voice on this, and that gives me hope that we will be able to reestablish the liberal proposition in in American politics. And there are those who are more pessimistic. I think Andrew Sullivan's one of them. Um, but you know, you're an you have an interesting vantage point in that you're young. You're you're not out of university that long. You have peers who probably don't share your political outlook completely. Um, and the, the the counter argument to Rausch's optimism is that this is so taken hold of a whole generation that this is now a generational fight. That we're actually that that there's just that that it's too inculcated. And your generation, um, what do you, what do you, where do you, where do you come out on that? I am more hopeful, I think, than than some of the the people along the lines of who you mentioned, like Andrew Sullivan. Um, I think if you look at some of the polling in terms of um, how this ideology that you call critical race theory or social justice or wokeism, I think when you look at the polling, um, it is actually not as popular 
as you would come to think based on how pervasive it is in our media and in our institutions. So the reason that I'm hopeful is because I think a lot of people disagree with this. Um, and, and I think a lot of people can see why it is so wrong to, to, to pursue these, these ideologies that wish to treat people differently based on their color um, or their race or their, their religion. And I think a lot of people feel and understand why that's wrong. Um, but I think the problem is that th these people are so afraid to speak up because the vanguard of these ideologies are so, so loud and ingrained in our most important institutions like academia um, and journalism and the Democratic Party. Um, so I am hopeful because I think that there's a large population of people that if they start to see other people stand up to these ideas and see that, okay, there, there's these people that I respect that also feel this way. Um, I'm not racist, I'm not wrong. Um, there's nothing wrong with the way that I'm thinking um, and I can stand up. Then I think we'll see a big change um, start to happen. And recently, persuas persuasion- Among your generation as well, do you believe like, there's a lot of people like you who are, I'm guessing, you know, someone in your mid twenties or whatever that, you know, that, uh, Agree with you? I do, um, and I think so. One persuasion just published an article that was that polled people based on, or th that wrote about a poll that um, asked people their feelings on cancel culture. And the 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 generation that was most against cancel culture was Gen Z, um, wow. and the, the cohort in Gen Z that was most against cancel culture was the youngest cohort of Gen Z. Um, Millennials were the, the, the ones that were most in favor of cancel culture, um, although it was still extremely unpopular. It was in like the it, it was underwater. Um, it was net unpopular among my generation. So I think th that's one reason for hope is that if you look at the data, the stuff is just not that popular, even though the people who who advance it are really loud and are the ones that may have may be leading our institutions. Um, I think it's really just not that popular. And even just uh, from personal experience, like if you talk to people who aren't um, so ingrained in, in politics every day, even among my generation, um, people just don't, they, they understand largely why this is, why this ideology is dangerous. Um, and of course, that's less the case on college campuses um, and it's less the case in media and these other institutions. But when I, I think when you when you look at the numbers and you actually talk to people who aren't immersed in this fight that we have all the time, um, this stuff is less is actually less pervasive and less popular. And people are just like, yeah, that's kind of weird. Um, why would I want to like have affinity groups where we separate black, white, and Asian people? Um, people just people understand that it's it's wrong at its their core. So I'm I'm more hopeful than than a lot of folks might be. Um, so so I, I don't know what your what your perspective is. Oh, it's a, those numbers are really hopeful, by the way. It makes it sound less like a, a generational challenge. You know, um, somebody I, I was talking to yesterday um, said, well, what about the academy? What about, you know, universities? Like, aren't we really stuck with a generation of professors that are going to keep on teaching the same thing? And the answer might be, that's true. I'm not sure the university is going to have the influence that it used to either, by the way. And it may be that because of the sort of decline of the university model, we'll see fewer people taking humanities classes, which is not necessarily a good thing, but fewer people inculcated in some of these ideologies at the same time. Um, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll sign up for, uh, for hopeful. Um, and, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's going to be an interesting fight for the next uh, the next few years. Um, um, so you're Jewish. This is a Jewish podcast. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, did you, uh, to what degree, if at all, do you, did your upbringing um, affect the way you look at issues now? Yeah. So I think there's there's a a few ways that my Judaism affects. My, my politics and the way I see the world now. Um, I grew, my dad was a rabbi, so I grew up pretty, and I went to Jewish summer camp. I did a lot of the, the classic Jewish things. Um, I'm less 
observant now than I used to be or that I was when I was growing up and practicing for my bar mitzvah. Um, but still, it definitely affected my worldview. I think in w- one sense, I don't know if my love of being an outsider stems from being Jewish or um, or it's a personality I, quirk. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't necessarily know where that came in, but I think my Judaism either um, made me become, made me feel free to, to be an outsider um, and have different perspectives um, and, and just feel more comfortable in that space where you're not the same as, as everyone around you. Um, and then another thing that I've honestly been struggling with um, kind of a lot recently in terms of politics and my identity is that I feel like my Judaism kind of pulls me in two directions. On the one hand, um, I, I strongly believe that all humans um, are of perfectly equal value. Um, I'm an individualist, a humanist. I think that we need to respect people based on their who the, the fact that they're a human and an individual. Um, but then on the, the, the other hand, like I, I know that when I see another Jew, there's like an immediate connection there. And there is a sense of a tribalism and connection that you have with other Jews. So I have a sort of conflict there where I feel like I don't want to necessarily identify um, more with somebody just because I share a religion with them. I want to identify with them because they're a good person, um, because they're a human being, because um, we have this, we share the same, same ideas and, and values um, rather than simply based on the fact that they're Jewish. Um, so I, I feel like that is, is something that's embedded in our politics, an idea that's kind of ingrained in a lot of things that we talk about and it's something that I feel a tension um, within me. I'm wondering if that tension is not actually quite healthy in a way. In other words, they're not as mutually exclusive as you as they might appear. And, and in fact, in some ways you can find, as Ellie Wiesel used to say, I find my humanity through my Judaism in a way. It, like, uh, you know, he, and, and he would still, you know, of course relate to people based on their common humanity, but he's, he finds through the Jewish tradition and through his membership to the Jewish people a, a vision of humanity that he wants to share with the world. I think that's, that's, that's right. And so what I, generally where I've come to, to land kind of is, I'm okay with that with with that feeling of connection um, and feeling like I can immediately connect with other people as long as I use that connection to expand the universe of people that I feel like I have a connection with. Um, if if I think the problem is if you start to see to to use Judaism as a way to contract the number of people that you connect with in the world, um, and as long as you're using it to expand the number of people that you feel like you identify with. Um, and can connect with and have a relationship with, I think it's acceptable. And I think it's the same case, uh, kind of parlaying this into politics, that's similar to how I feel about some sorts of of nationalism, is that I think that nationalism can be dangerous if you use it as a way to to contract the universe of people that you're willing to care for and respect. But so long as you're using it to expand the number of people that you're doing that with, I think it's, it's more healthy. Yeah. That's a great analogy. So I was going to end there, but I actually had a question that I planned to ask you earlier and it sort of escaped me for a second. So maybe we'll reorder this in the podcast itself, or maybe we'll just uh, div- div- diverge a little bit. Um, I know that Persuasion had a piece on CRT. I think I saw it this morning. Um, obviously, that's become a major public issue. Who would have thunk it? Um, um, and and what, what I this is what I've seen among sort of my progressive woke friends on this that initially they sort of were in denial that CRT was being taught in any way, but now it seems that the party line is no CRT itself is not being taught, but we should teach kids how systemic racism operates in society. Um, what do you think? So let's put aside the term CRT, and I have a, an article coming out and real clear education on this in the next few days. Um, what do you think about this idea about syst- that we should teach systemic racism? That's that's a great question. I, I like the idea of kind of tossing away the, the CRT discussion because I think that obscures things a lot. 
Um, my general idea with systemic racism is that I'm open to the idea that there are certain laws and institutions that treat people differently based on their identity, whether it's uh, race, gender, religion. Um, and I, if someone can show me the evidence that these policies or these institutions um, are in fact acting on people in different ways because of the color of their skin or because of their religion, then I think we need to reform those institutions. But if, if what people are calling systemic racism is sim sim simply the fact that these institutions and these policies result in disparities between groups, I don't think that's enough proof at all um, to show that systemic racism exists. Um, so my, my general philosophy is, yes, I'm open to the idea that these institutions have, have biases within them, but the, the hypothesis, the null hypothesis, the idea that you start out with shouldn't be, of course, these are racist institutions and we need to find where it is and root it out because it's embedded in everything. Um, it needs to be, we have an open, open mind. And if someone can present the evidence that the institutions or policies are um, racist, in which, by which I mean actually discriminating against people because of the color of their skin, um, or any other identity that they have, um, then we need to reform that. You know, I've been using this phrase that I think has unnerved uh, some folks, um, that um, there's systemic racism in America, but America is not systemically racist. Um, now, where systemic racism exists, I think, is, as, you, as you're indicating, is a matter of sort of inquiry. Right, it's not something that we should agree on in advance. We have to look and debate and discuss and try to figure out whether we think systemic racism is at work or something else might be at work, or it might be systemic racism in combination with many other factors that might explain the current uh, order of business. Um, but my, my my argument in this piece, I want to try this out on you. What was threefold? Um, one is that there, there there's sort of like three fallacies that people are using and making the case that we must teach systemic racism in, uh, in school or establish it in our companies or whatever other institutions we're part of. Um, one is this argument of history that America has always been, you know, was always a racist country with slavery and redlining and reconstruction and all the rest. And I said, yeah, that's all true. But um, we had the civil rights movement and now it's become murkier and we have to actually figure out what, what, whether systemic racism is still there. Just because something happened in the past doesn't mean it's happening in the present. So that's number for fallacy number one. The second fallacy I call the fallacy of instances. And it's when someone will then point to a specific instance where they're quite sure it's systemic racism, like Flint, Michigan. And they'll say, this happened in Flint, so therefore there's systemic racism. So therefore we should understand how it's embedded in society. And I'll say, well, you've proved that one instance, perhaps. Let's talk about it. But you haven't proved that there is this kind of systemic racism everywhere all the time. It's not necessarily ubiquitous. Um, the, third, the third fallacy is sort of the monofactorial fallacy. I didn't call it that. But it was sort of this idea that there's that really um, no other explanation will do. And sometimes you're accused of privilege or racism by suggesting that there might be other factors at work, but that um, it is possible to say systemic racism can be a factor in institutions, but so might culture, so might economics, so might um, the average age of a specific subgroup in question. Um, and you could look at all those factors and try to understand what's going on and not just racism. What, what do you make of that sort of uh, suite of arguments that I'm making against teaching systemic racism as if it is the uh, as if it is the sole explanatory factor of of disparity in this country. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think each of those three arguments is is right on, and people want to have an easy way to explain. So there are disparities between the races, and pe what people want is an easy way to describe the world, a narrative that can can easily explain everything that they see and they won't have to, to look at the world in a more complex way. And the world is complicated um, and these narratives, these sweeping narratives that explain everything um, 
just are not going to be sufficient or adequate to explaining all the complex things that are happening in the world. So the way you lay it out, it's like people want to say, America has a racist past. Look at this specific instance today that proves that nothing has changed. And then look at the disparate outcomes, which proves that those two previous things um, are in fact true. And I think that that's just not a logical argument. You can take each of those individually without coming to the idea um, that America is systemically racist. You can, yes, agree that America has a racist past. Um, you can agree that there are still instances of racism that happen today. And you can agree um, that there are disparate in, uh, uh, results between uh, races and all sorts of people. Um, I think that uh, French, French Americans make something like 70% um, of what Russian Americans make. So there, there's, there's these disparities that exist in society. And, and just because those disparities exist doesn't necessarily mean that the previous two things that you stated, which is um, America has a racist past and is still racist today, um, and, and systemic racism is, it is embedded in everything, um, that those disparities don't prove that. And I think your argument is, is right on. Right. All right, well, we'll see what others think too, I guess, in the coming days. Um, um, so Seth, it's really been great to have you on. Um, I love your writing. Um, I think you're a really clear thinker. I'm not surprised that uh, the persuasion crowd in Yashka Monk would uh, see that in you. And um, I look forward to being in touch and hopefully involved in, if you're interested in the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values over time. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was great to chat. Um, I always love talking over ideas and I, I listen to the podcast and follow you. So um, would love to be in touch further. And, and thank you for having me on.